reading some Heidelich like Nietzsche, <clears throat> Heidelich like Nietzsche, Human All to Human, a book for free spirits, R.J. Hollingdale, his translation, one of the best. Anyway, uh, I'm going a little bit early today. The Religious Life. Three. So this is a new chapter, the third chapter. We finished last time, the second chapter. So the third chapter, the religious life. 108. I feel like I've read this. Well, maybe I have. The twofold struggle against an ill. When we're when we are assailed by an ill, we can dispose of it either by getting rid of its cause or by changing the effect it produces on our sensibilities. That is to say, to reinterpreting the ill into, an, into a good whose good effects will perhaps be perceptible only later. Religion and art, and metaphysical philosophy too, endeavor, endeavor to bring about a change of sensibility partly through changing our judgment as, as to the nature of our experiences. For example, with the aid of the proposition, whom God loveth, he chastiseth. Partly through awakening the ability, so that was a aid of a proposition. And also partly through awakening the ability to take pleasure in pain, in emotion in general from which the art of tragedy takes its starting point, right? The more a man inclines towards reinterpret... I mean, I like this way of... He's not the first to connect religion and art, actually, but, uh, well... You know, well, at the very least, a lot of people after him have, has done this. I'm not sure who was the first, but he might be the first with religion, art, and metaphysical philosophy. Maybe. Maybe not. Uh, anyway. Even Ingman Berman said um, it's just our, you know, uh, our art and religion are just two things that we uh, it's just based on our like sensibility. Well, oh hello, hello, uh, purple Josh. <laughs> it's been a while. Um, how are you? How you been? Do you have a lot of studies? Probably. Uh, brought a friend along. Who's that? Who's that? Who's that? Is that uh? <clears throat> now I feel pressure. No, I'm just kidding. Um, all right, so the more, all right, so I'll just continue. Uh, the more a man inclines towards reinterpretation, the less in attention he will give to the cause of the ill. All right, all right, well. I've been busy, all, uh, wanted to join yesterday, but connection was bad. Yeah, that's, uh, it happens. Yeah, it happens sometimes, actually. Uh, I think lately in Sweden it has been, well, maybe not lately, but um, we used to be the best, you know, in terms of, well, the best. Well, we used to be actually one of the best in terms of internet connections and stuff, but I'm not sure who's the best now in, in the world. Well, best, you know, fastest. I guess, I guess China, I don't know. Uh, in terms of, you know, great connection and stuff like that. Internet connection. The more a man inclines towards reinterpretation. Zlatan Ibrahimovic, Marwan. Yeah, I'm, I'm the intellectual Zlatan. <laughs> um, the more a man inclines towards reinterpretation. I want to pick with you. <laughs> I'll give you my uh, autograph. 
I found my neighbor doing something illegal yesterday. What? Cutting down a tree? Wow. Uh, was he just randomly cutting down a tree or something? Yeah, you're not allowed to do that, obviously. Well, kill him. No, that's a little bit drastic to kill him just because he's cutting down a tree. Or maybe, maybe Marwin is, a, uh, you know, protecting the trees, the pr tree protector, the rights of the tree. Well, obviously it is life as well, but. Uh, <laughs> listen to Mr. Zlatan's advice. Yeah, which is don't kill the man. <laughs> well, it depends on the man. <laughs> depends on who it is. He was complaining about the tree as it blocks the sunshine in his yard. <laughs> right. Well, maybe he's right. You know, sun is... Um, it is... Uh, it is actually important. But, um, yeah, I have, I have it on camera too. <laughs> Are you going to send it to the police or something? Yeah, you're not allowed to do that. Um, you could complain more to the, you know, communal people who work with stuff like that. But, uh, yeah. I mean, he could have, but now it's too late. So, but it's so selfish. No, no, not moral to do. Yeah, yeah. Also, like, even if you do something like that, let's say, I would say you would have to plant another one somewhere else, uh, just to make up for that, or maybe ten more, you know, trees or something. But it's actually important to have trees as well around us so you know obviously i'm not for <laughs> cutting down trees like that uh, unless it's in his own own garden or whatever but uh, yeah this wasn't so yeah no of course um the more a man inclines towards reinterpretation the less attention he will give to the cause of the ill and to doing away with it the momentary amelioration and narcoticizing. He will later say in later, we'll talk about this intoxication thing. Well, he, he doesn't go against intoxication uh, in, in terms of self-intoxication, but he is against, uh, well, he did take drugs sometimes, otherwise, well, later, otherwise he couldn't go to sleep. I'm talking about Nietzsche here. Uh, but uh, he was against uh, alcohol. Nietzsche was totally against alcohol. Socrates or Plato? Well, uh, I would say Socrates. I would rather have Socrates. Although, well, good question. Uh, to a certain extent, Socrates, but I don't know. Because at least Plato is inspired by Heraclitus as well. While Socrates, as far as I know, well, there is a text that says that a text that says that Socrates read Heraclitus. So but Plato actually includes it kind of also. That's the way he, he solves the whole uh, you know, everything is everything changing or is everything still with Parmenides? Uh, but Plato is more like, well, it looks like it changes, but there is this ultimate perfect place somewhere else that isn't changing in that sense because it's perfect. Using the doubt method on Plato. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. But um, the whole dialogue thing, but 
that was popular with other you know it's not it's not like plato invented the whole dialogue thing or even when actually we don't know much about socrates because we only have socrates through plato or through uh, other thinkers through other disciples i forget the na- other name x something Z- something like that yeah but i can't even question that <laughs> uh but yeah we don't actually know a lot there and also plato uses uh socrates differently if i remember correctly in the beginning like the first text are more maybe a little bit like socrates but later it seems like because he sometimes just uses socrates as a way of explaining his own uh the the truer the truer answer like he will get you will get a couple of different answers. Like in Symposium, you have a b- different people, and then it gets to Socrates, and that's the, basically Plato's ult- more ultimate answer, so to speak. That's not Socrates. That's actually Plato that's talking. Uh, although it's Plato that made a whole, whole thing, but, but still. Anyway. Uh, narcoticizing. Uh, such as is normally... Let me read this. <laughs> The more a man inclines towards reinterpretation, the less attention he will give to the cause of the ill and to doing away with it. The momentary amelioration and narcoticizing, narcoticizing, such as is normally employed, for example, in in a case of a toothache, suffices him in the case of a more serious sufferings too. The more the domination, the more the domination of the religions and all the arts of narcosis declines, the stricter attention men pay to the actual abolition. Abolition, sorry. The stricter attention men pay to the actual abolition of the ill. Yeah, through science. Which is, to be sure, a bad lookout for the writers of tragedies, for there is less and less material for tragedy, because the realm of inexorable, implacable destiny is growing narrower, and narrower but an even wor- so yeah but an even worse one for the priests for these have hitherto lived on the narcoticizing of human ills well <laughs> yeah that's true a lot of that is true actually well especially priests but i wouldn't say the whole shaman thing is an older thing and the priest is kind of from the shaman but the shaman wasn't you know it wasn't it wasn't, uh, you know, it's not like a parasite like that. The parasite, I would say, only happens, you know, bad priests and stuff happens because it's civilization. This is relaxing and interesting. That's great. Uh, imagine the smell. <laughs> uh, great name. You read from an e-reader, sir. Yes. I was thinking about getting one. Yeah, I'm reading from a Samsung. Uh, it's a Samsung one. This is not a Kindle. Yeah, this one is great. I had an older one, uh, but yeah, that broke down, and I had, you know, I, it was like seven years old, <laughs> so I had to, yeah, had to get this one. Well, I didn't have to get this one, but uh, I do like Samsung. Uh, uh, I prefer to have Samsung stuff, but maybe Kindle is better. Actually, I don't know. I've, I've been interested in. I'm interested in Kindle, but. I don't know. Um, I I like my freedom in in uh, if I want to root something, if I want to change something, I've never rooted anything like a rooting up a you know a Android thing. Uh, but I like the freedom to have that, or the possibility rather, the option. So did I did I say the whole thing there? Yeah, I did. I did. Uh, narrow, narrow. Like that's a that's a this passage here is very modern as well. You see, he's saying that you know uh, the 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 lookout for writers of tragedy. It's a bad lookout for writers of tragedy. Like art, it's getting narrower and narrower for art to capture some sort of you know to make this. It's a ridiculous. It's a little bit ridiculous when we look back at older you know art, but. So, so 
it looks ridiculous because today we have so much information about ills, like like he says here, not just ills, but, you know, because he's talking about tragedy here. Uh, well, no, it's because he talks about ills. It's called twofold struggle against an ill. Uh, but in terms of art and, and religion, religion has less and less power in this health thing. And even art has less and less power, so to speak, uh, in, in terms of, in terms of uh, or, or maybe not power, but practicality or, or uh, use, usefulness, right? Because science in, is increasingly just taking this stuff up. Uh, but, but still today, I would say we have a long way to go, actually, in terms of our health, like properly. Um, I believe it will totally change once we have nanobots in our bodies, correcting stuff all the time. I think that's going to change us. Totally. All right, but that's that's not Nietzsche. Uh, well, maybe it would have been, but <laughs> uh, I wonder what he, he would have thought. Um, he would probably be for it, maybe. Because he is, a lot of times he is forward like that. 109, sorrow is knowledge. But even, even though he says, you know, tragedy is getting narrower and narrower, you know, it doesn't mean that it disappears or that it can't, you know, still have a useful usefulness, be useful. How one, and also art in general, is always going to be useful to us. I believe that. Uh, but it's going to change, right? The same as movies, you know, as soon as cinema came. I don't think he experienced cinema. Like, cinema came actually... 1895, uh, but um, and but Nietzsche was all well. Yeah, Nietzsche was already gone by then. Uh, mentally, he was gone. Uh, 1889. Technically, the first film films, and I've seen these. Uh, it's from they're from 1888, but I highly doubt that he saw he saw nothing of that. I mean, I'm 100 percent sure, 100 percent sure. Although, of course, he knew about the photography uh, because obviously we have photographs of him. Uh, and, you know, it's around that time. So, so he is aware of, you know, science and technology and stuff like that. So um, maybe that's why he's kind of, you know, can see where it's going sometimes. Although he's not doing it in all the ways we, you know, uh, we still don't have computers really. So uh, he can't really predict anything there. Although he did say computer. <laughs> anyway, well, that's a translation thing as well. How, I think, uh, depends on what it says. Anyway, sorrow is knowledge. How one would like to exchange the false assertions of the priests that there is a God who desires that we do good is the guardian and the witness of every action, every moment, every thought, who loves us and in every misfortune wants only what is best for us. How one would like to exchange these for truths, truths that would be as salutary, salutary, pacifying and beneficial as those errors are. Yet such truths do not exist. The most philosophy can do is set against them other physical, no, metaphysical. Yet such truths do not exist. The most philosophy can do is set against them other metaphysical plausibility abilities at bottom likewise untruth so let me reread this how one would like to exchange the false assertions of the priests that there is a god who desires that we do do anything good here that we do good is the guardian and the witness of every action every moment every thought who loves us and in every misfortune wants only what is best for us how one would like to exchange these for truth that would be as salutary, pacifying, and beneficial as those errors are, right? But we, yet such truths do not exist. The most philosophy can do is set against them other metaphysical plausibilities. At bottom, likewise, untruths. The tragedy, however, lies in the fact 
that one cannot believe those dog these dogmas of religion and metaphysics if one has in one's heart and head the rigorous method of acquiring truth. While on the other hand, one has, while on that one, on the other hand, one has, through the development of humanity, grown so tender, sensitive, and afflicted, one has, has need of means of cure and comfort of the most potent description, from which there thus arises the danger that man may bleed to, to death from knowledge of truth, right? So maybe, so you see, maybe art has a even more important role in the future, like a new role. So we don't bleed to death from knowledge of truth. <laughs> I'm not sure I would do that, but... Or we would do that. I'm not so sure about that. Well, maybe. Uh, but maybe that means we need um, to reevaluate a lot of things. This was expressed by Byron in, in immortal verse. Right. Sorrow is knowledge. Um, sorrow is knowledge. They who know the most must mourn the deepest or the fatal truth. And the tree of knowledge is not that of life. Uh, from Byron's Manfred, Act 1, Scene 1. Uh, right. For such cares, there is no better antidote. For such cares, there is no better antidote, at least the worst hours and eclipses of the soul, than to conjure up the solemn frivolity of Horace, and with him to say to oneself, all right, so Latin here. I'm going to read it in Latin. It's not actually hard to read Latin. It's just, you know, I don't understand all of it. Um, I, I understand aeternis. Um, quid aeternis minorem consilis, consilis, no, consilis animum fatigas, cur non sub alta vel, platano vel hac, pinu iacentes. All right. I know that every C is actually K. <laughs> I know that much. Kida Ternis, uh, why torment your mind, which is which is unequal to it? Let me see here. Unequal. All right. Why why torment your mind, which is unequal to it, with count with counsel for eternity? Why not come and lie under this tall plane tree or this pine? Well, I would say the whole thing with the eternity there is because we don't want to die. <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> we're dying and we don't want to die. And that's why I think uh, we're, we'll always have this struggle. Or for a very long time anyway. Uh, I think the struggle will change in the future, but um, it's still going to be a tr struggle there. What is certain, however, is that any degree of frivolity or melancholy is better than a romantic return and desertion. An approach to Christianity in any form, for so, so you see here, uh, you see he's against returning. Think of Peterson here a little bit. What is certain, however, is that any degree of frivolity or melancholy is better than a romantic return or desertion, an approach to Christianity in any form. For... Given the current state of knowledge, one can no longer have any association with it without incurably dirtying one's intellectual conscience. There you go. And prostituting it before oneself and others. <laughs> you see? There is no way of going back. All right. Those agonies may be painful enough, but without agonies, one cannot become a leader and educator of mankind. And woe to him who wants to attempt it but no longer possesses this clean conscious. conscience. <laughs> I mean, if that's not a Nietzschean, uh, you know, counter, uh, you know, to Peterson himself, then I, I, I don't know what is. I don't know what is, you know. <laughs> he clearly states it here. All right, 110. 110 here. Truth in religion. 
the pure, of course, you know, you, you can obviously, you can ignore it. <laughs> That's how you do that. But, uh, you know, dirt, you're still dirting your intellectual conscience. You are because you can't really, how are you going to put it together? Like, you already know that this isn't really truthful in that sense. So you gotta make it like a story, you know, like you gotta make the value just story, just taking meaning out of it. But then you you actually trivialize meaning, in my opinion. You do trivialize meaning. Because then anything can be meaningful. And if anything can mean, be meaningful, you're actually not doing anything here. Uh, because it doesn't stand on anything. Like, obviously you can't think that anything is meaningful. If you have strong enough belief, but that doesn't mean that that's the truth. All right. Anyway, that's that's more my stuff. But <laughs> 110 truth in religion. In the period of the Enlightenment, the significance of religion was not adequately appreciated. Uh, so you see, he, he can also, uh, yeah. Of that, there can be no doubt. But it is just as certain. That in, in, in the reaction to the Enlightenment that followed, uh, it's also certain that in the reaction to the Enlightenment that followed, it was appreciated much too highly, right? Inasmuch as the religions were treated with love, almost amorously indeed, and were, for example, uh, adjudged to possess a profound, indeed, the profoundest possible understanding of the world. Science had only, only to remove their dogmatic dress in order to possess the truth in myth mythical form. Truth in mythic. I mean, you already <laughs> you get, you got it here as well. <laughs> what I just said. Mythical. The, make it a story. Like, right. Uh, the religions were thus such... The religions were thus. Such was the assertion of all opponents of the Enlightenment. Supposed to express sensu alleri, allegorico. Sensu allegorico with the sense of an allegorical, allegorical representation. Sensu uh, allegorico with the sense of an allegorical representation. Supposed to express sensu allegorico, having regard to the understanding of the masses. Let me reread this a little bit here. The religions were thus, such was the assertion of all opponents of the Enlightenment, supposed to express sensu allegorico, having regard to the understanding of the masses, that primal wisdom, which was wisdom as such, inasmuch as all true science of modern times had always led us towards it and not away from it, so that between the oldest sages of mankind and all the most recent, there reigned a harmony, indeed an identity of insights, and a progress in knowledge, assuming one wished to speak of such a thing, could apply not to the nature of knowledge, but only to the form in which it was communicated. In the form it was communicated. This whole conception of religion and the science and science, this whole con conception of religion and science is erroneous through and through, and no one would still venture to adhere to it if Schopenhauer's eloquence had not, ta had not taken it under its protection. There we go, he goes against... Uh, he goes against uh, uh, Schopenhauer here, again, distancing himself here. A and he saw, you know, this kind of a Christian thing in Schopenhauer, like many actually did. Well, he, he said some, he says some stuff there that's... Uh, an eloquence that rings loud and clear, that's why all of this pessimism stuff is associated with it also, well, kind of. Well, yeah, uh, eloquence to Nietzsche. Eloquence had not taken it under its protection. Uh, right, Schopenhauer, if he hadn't taken it under its protection. An eloquence that rings loud and clear, yet had to wait a generation before it reach, reached its audience. Yeah, he's kind of earlier, a little bit. Uh, certainly, one can gain very much towards an understanding of Christianity and other religions, from Schopenhauer's religio moral interpretation of men of the, and the world. Yeah. But it, even though he's not, you know, um, it's still a religio moral interpretation. Although Schopenhauer isn't, you know, totally 
it's not theological, but but it is just. But to Nietzsche, this is still you know a thing that we still hold like a relic, you know. But it is just as certain that he blundered over the value of religion with respect to knowledge. In this, he himself was an all too docile pupil of the scientific teachers of our of his time, who won and all paid uh, homage, homage, uh, homage to romanticism, and had renounced the spirit of the Enlightenment. Yes, well, uh, yeah. Here we go. Uh, teacher, scientific teacher. Yeah. So he's already actually this. Um, yeah. Well, it makes sense. Um, you know, he's not the. It's the spirit of the enlightenment through and through here as well. Like this whole book is that a book for free spirits, with with that spirit of the enlightenment. He's not saying you know. Um, that's why it's not scientism or or something like that, although it could be interpreted certain passages but because when he says you know uh, philosophy should mean more scientific uh, scientific teachers of his time who one and all paid uh, homage to romanticism and had renounced the spirit of the enlightenment born into our own time he could not possibly have spoken of the sensus allegoricus of religion he would rather have done honor to truth after his usual fashion with the words a religion has never yet, either directly or indirectly, either as dogma or as parable, contained contained the truth. Um, if you behave badly, you will be born in... Uh, <laughs> that doesn't make sense, but yeah. A religion has never yet, either directly or indirectly, either as a dogma or as parable, contained the truth. For every religion was born out of fear and need. Every religion was born out of fear and need. It has crept into existence along paths of aberrations of reason. Once, perhaps, when imperiled by science, it lyingly introduced some philosophical teaching or other into its system, so that later it could be discovered there. So that later it could be discovered there. But this is a theologian's artifice from the time when a religion is already doubting itself. It is these artifices uh, of theology, which in Christianity, as, as the religion of the scholarly age saturated with philosophy, were to be sure already being practiced very early, that have led to the superstition of sensus allegoricus. But it has been even more the habit of philosophers, and especially those half-creatures, the poeticizing philosophers, and philosophizing artists. <laughs> right. So he does against, go against that. Um, half-creatures, right? Habit of philosophers. Well, you, you could say that Nietzsche himself is... Well, I mean, he's doing poetry as well, so he's an artist as well. But that's not really what it means, mean, means here. Um, but it has been even more the habit of philosophers, and especially those half-creatures, the poeticizing philosophers and philosophizing artists, of treating all the sensations they discovered in themselves as fundamental qualities of mankind in general. And also in, in gay science, you, he kind of returns a little bit there. Of treating all the sensations they discovered in themselves as fundamental qualities of mankind in general, and therewith to, and therewith to permit their own religious sensations to to exert exert a significant influence on the intellectual structure of their systems. Yeah. Because you can feel this, you know, spirituality. I, I would say, you know, that's just an intense feeling. I've had spiritual, you know, sensations like that, but it doesn't mean that I, I don't incorporate, like, I don't take that and say, yeah, well, yeah, it's true, you know, this thing is there, and so forth, in, in reality. There is a big difference there. Because philosophers have frequently philosophized, even when I was in the deepest, deepest, you know, 
because philosophers have frequently philosophized within a religious tradition, or at least under the inherited power of the celebrated metaphysical need. There you go. They have achieved hypotheses which have in fact been very similar to Jewish or Christian or Indian religious dogmas. Similar, that is to say, in the way children are usually similar to the mothers. Except that in this case, the fathers, so you see a little bit of, you can see a little bit of Jordan Peterson here. Um, and he, he thinks then, you know, well, we got to go back and blah, blah, blah. But then you're not intellectually honest, like Nietzsche said in the previous um, part. He, will, he says that, you know, more, not just once, but in more case, cases. Similar to Jewish or Christian or Indian religious dogma. Similar, that is to say, in the way children are usually similar to their mothers, except that in this case the fathers were not aware of this fact of motherhood, a thing that does not, does no doubt happen, right? Because we're talking about a whole of history here. Yet have fabled on, yet have fabled on in innocent astonishment of a family resemblance between all religion and science. In reality, there exists between religion and true science neither affinity nor friendship nor even enmity. They dwell on different stars. You see, he, he separates. They're like totally different things. I mean, in a lot of ways, it's not that far from the truth there. Um, I mean, science becomes the rigorous philosophy, basically. Like, philosophy was the first attempt of actually understanding, well, is it atoms? Like, forget about Zeus. Is it atoms? You know, Democritus. Uh, is it water? Is it fire, Heraclitus? Is it water, Thales? And so forth. Uh, is it the four elements? You know, we've got a bunch of stuff here. But, uh, so it's an attempt of truly understanding the world. So that is philosophy. Like, uh, but then, then it became rigorous, like, you know, we study the, the, the oceans and we'll, we'll look at it and take it apart and experiment and observe even deeper and so forth. And, and we, not just that, but we systematize it. And uh, that becomes basically science. Uh, and you make hypotheses and you, you test those. Although it's not always that approach, like it's very easy to also make the scientific method, you know, there is no one scientific method. That's the thing. And, uh, you know, it depends on what we're doing here. In, in, in astronomy, you, you observe a lot. Although, of course, you have instruments that can count things, you know, intensity of light and stuff, or radio waves. But it's not like you, you know, you capture those. And then, of course, you also have equations. But in earlier science, like, I would say even Aristotle was kind of a scientist, almost, like, on the, on the way there. He had his own team and looking for, um, you know, mar marine biology, basically. Aristotle was very interested in that. And um, so you see a lot of early stuff there. And that's just, you know, an extension of this curiosity of this. We want to know more. We want to know truth about our reality, not just our art and our mythology and so forth you know you, you start when you start doing that then mythology and so forth will look like lies or at best it looks like first attempts uh but it's not even really first attempts i would say like i, I think it's a different reason why, why we you know but we'll i'll take that another day Every philosophy that exhibits a gleaming, gleaming religious comet tail in the darkness of its ultimate conclusions thereby casts suspicion on everything in it that is presented as science, right? All of, all of that, too, is presumably likewise religion, even if it is dressed up as science. Um, for the rest... Even if all the peoples were in agreement over certain religious matters, for example, the existence of a god, which, by the way, is not the case in regard to this particular point, this would in fact be no more than a counter-argument against the thing asserted. 
let me read uh, for the rest even if all the peoples were in agreement over certain religious matters for example the existence of a god which is by the way not the case in regard to this particular point so existence of a god this would in fact be no more than a counter argument against the thing as asserted for example the existence of a god the consensus genitum and hominum all right consensus genitum hominum uh, unanimous opinion of all mankind consensus genitum and hominum uh, we'll see here consensus hominum sapientum theum you know all the wise sapientia that's you know homo sapiens means you know um, well basically uh, sapiens can be you know um, well it's obviously modern hum humans but uh, if I remember correctly, homo can also mean our own and wisdom, right? Sapientia. Uh, but, yeah. The consensus geni, gen, gentium, let me just quickly. Because you have a literal, literal, uh, Uh, yeah, homo means human being, while part uh, sapiens mean discerning, wise, sensible. Exactly, homo. But ho homo, I remember, could be human being, but um, earthling, right? But that's Indo-European, Proto-Indo-European. Humus, Latin. Uh, man, man. Yeah. But I think it was our own as well, but maybe that was from uh, like ourselves. Maybe that was from uh, Greek. Or maybe it wasn't. Maybe I remember correctly. Uh, Anyway, it doesn't matter, but yeah. Uh, well, yeah, uh, human, human being, human, man, and wise, basically. Sapientia. Well, wise could also be sensible, uh, and uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, the consensus gen gentium and hominum. So, unanimous opinion of all mankind, in general, can fairly be considered only a piece of folly. On the other hand, there exists... There exists no consensus omnium sapientium, unanimous opinion of all the wise, whatever in regard to any single thing, with the exception of that of which Goethe's lines speak. Well, so he's the only <laughs> exception. Alle die Wesensten aller der Seiten lächeln und winken und stimmen mit ein, törigt auf Besserung der Toren zu haren. Kinder der Klagheit, I think uh, children uh, complain. Let, let me see here. Is it? Or, well, no, it says fools. But isn't Kinder children? I don't know. Uh, but a cloud uh, I'm pretty sure is. We'll see here. Uh, Kinder der Klu Klugheit. No, Klu Klugheit. All right. Ah, uh, maybe um, maybe s smart, like smart. Uh, Kinder, Kinder, <laughs> Kinder, Kinder der Klugheit. O habet die Naren eben zum Naren auch, wie sich ger gehört. All right, so that means, <laughs> let me do the English here, the note here. All the wisest of every age are in agreement. It is foolish to wait for fools 
to be cured of their folly. It is foolish to wait for the fools to be cured of their folly. The proper thing to do is to make fools of the fools. <laughs> From Goethe's Kopistich. Koptisches lied. Koptisches lied. Lines three to seven. Right. Uh, Moira fate. All right. We'll get to Moira. Moira. Expressed without uh, meter. Meter. Metre. <laughs> I want to read in French. Here. Expressed with meter and rhyme. Metri. Metre? I don't know. I think it's meter, but expressed without meter and rhyme and applied to our case, the consensus sapientium is that the consensus genitum, gentium is a piece of folly. Anyway, 11. Origin of the religious cult. Now that sounded like an audiobook there. Origin of the religious cult. <laughs> if we transport ourselves all right, if we transport ourselves back to the ages in which the religious life flourished most vigorously, we discover a fundamental conviction that which we no longer share and on account of which we see the door to the religious life once and for all close to us. It concerns nature and our traffic with nature. I like that expression, traffic with nature. <laughs> Just checked what the guy is risking. Two months in custody uh, or a file of max, 4,200 euro. Wow. <laughs> As I'm a law student. Right. Yeah, that, well, then, then that's super interesting. Well, for you, then that's probably super interesting. <clears throat> if you, you know, obviously, I assume you, you like what you're doing. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that. Well, depends on where you are, I guess. But two months custody, or a file of the max of max four thousand two hundred euros. Yeah, I thought it might be. Yeah, well, that's that's quite a lot. Of, yeah, well, that's quite a lot. Uh, well, for regular people like that, I guess. Uh, well, you know, most for most people, that's a lot of money. Uh, origin of the religious cult if we transport ourselves back to the ages in which well i already read this i'm gonna reread it read this if we transport ourselves back to the ages in which the religious life flourished most vigorously we discover a fundamental conviction which we no longer share and on account of which we see the door to the religious life once and for all close to us it concerns nature and our traffic with nature in those ages one in those ages, one as yet knows nothing of natural laws. Ah, uh, one as yet knows nothing of natural laws. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Neither earth nor sky are constrained by any compul compulsion. A season, sunshine, rain can come or they can fail to come. Any, uh, yeah, right, right. That, that's the thing there. Yeah. Like if you put yourself into this. You know, it comes and goes, and the gods are a way of explaining, like thunder god and so forth. Uh, any conception of natural causality, uh, any conception of natural causality, is altogether lacking. When one rows, it is not the rowing which moves the ship. Rowing is only a magical ceremony by which, what uh, by means of which. One compels a demon to move the ship. Right, you're not really thinking about the whole mechanics there. Although, well, usually we don't think about it either. But we're well aware of it. All, you know, it's all, it's kind of, well, sometimes I actually think about stuff like that. But All illness, death itself, is the result of magical influences. And part of the whole thing, you know, like life. Becoming ill and dying never occur naturally. The whole conception of a natural occurrence is lacking. It first dawns with older Greeks, that is to say, in a very late phase of mankind, in the conception 
of a moira, moira, yeah, fate, moira. Uh, in the conception of a moira, moira, enthroned above the gods, above the gods, right? Yes. When someone shoots with the bow, there is still an irrational hand and force at work with it. If the wells suddenly dry up, one thinks first of all the subterranean demons and their knavery. It must be an be the arrow of a god through whose invisible action a man suddenly sinks down. In India, according to Lubok, Lubok, Sir, Sir John Lubok, uh, Lubok, English historian, Sir John Lub Lubok, Lubok. I'm too much into these other names. <laughs> Sir John Lubok. Uh, English historian, 1837, 1913, died 1913. He became, he was old, well, obviously Nietzsche died earlier, yeah, young. He was both, yeah, older, died later. Um, according to Lubbock, you see he, he likes English also, English and French. In India, according to Lubbock, a carpenter is accustomed to make sacrifices to his hammer, his axe, and his other tools. A Brahman treats the crayon with which he writes. This Eastern philosophy is actually important to Nietzsche as well, like eternal recurrence and stuff like that. Uh, you know, but a carpenter is accustomed to make sacrifices to his hammer in, in India. In his axe and his other tools, a Brahman treats the crayon with which he writes a soldier, the weapon he employs in field, in the field, a mason, his trowel, a laborer, his plow, in the same way. The whole of nature is in the conception of religious men, a sum of actions by conscious and volitional beings. A tremendous complex of arbitrariness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's because you had a totally different conception of the world mentality. We increasingly go away from this. It's kind of a fantasy thing. It's almost as if it was more of a fantasy back then. <laughs> maybe it was. Uh, maybe it was. Maybe that's why magic has gone away. <laughs> uh, we look too much into reality. In regard to everything external to us, no conclusion can be drawn that something will be thus or thus, must happen thus or thus. It is we who are the more or less secure and calculable. Man is the rule. Nature is the irregularity. This proposition contains the fundamental conviction which dominates rude, religiously productive, primitive cultures. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> rude. We men of today feel precisely the opposite. The richer a man feels within himself, the more polyphonic, polyphonic his subjectivity, subjectivity is the more powerfully is he impressed by the uniformity of nature. With Goethe, we all recognize in nature the great means of composture. No, composure. We all recognize conformity of nature with Goethe. We all recognize in nature the great means of composure for the modern soul. We listen to the beat of the pendulum of this mightiest of clocks with a longing for rest. For becoming settled and still, as though we could imbibe this uniformity into ourselves, and thereby, at last, come to an enjoyment of ourselves. Oh, this is a long one. Usually it's not that long for Nietzsche in one of these. Come to last. All right. I'll just... Uh... Oh, it is. It's tempting to make it practical, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, that's for damaging a tree, which isn't yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I don't think you can avoid making it practical, then, I think. But, yeah. Uh, formerly, the reverse was the case. The reverse formerly the reverse was the case if we think back to rude primitive conditions of peoples or if we look closely at present-day savages we find we find them determined in the strongest way 
by the law, by tradition. The individual is tied to them almost automatically and moved with the regularity of a pendulum. To him, nature, uncomprehended, dreadful, mysterious nature, must seem to... Must, must, uh, no. <laughs> to him, uh, nature... <laughs> Some... Uh, the machinery broke down there. <laughs> to him, nature, uncomprehended, dreadful, mysterious nature, must seem the domain of freedom, of caprice, of a higher power. Indeed, as it were, a superhuman stage of existence, a god. All right. But every individual living. Uh, and, but every individual living in such ages and conditions feels how his existence, his happiness, that of the family and the state, the success of any undertun, undertaking depends on these arbitrariness of nature. Arbitrarinesses of nature. Certain natural events must occur at the right time. Others fail to occur. How can one exercise an influence over these terrible unknown powers? How can one fetter the domain of freedom? Thus he asked himself. Thus he anxiously, anxiously seeks. Are there, are there then no means of regulating these powers through a tra tradition and law in just the way you are regulated by them? You are re regulated by them. The believer in magic and miracles reflects on how to impose a law on nature. And in brief, the religious cult is the outcome of this reflection. Right. The problem these men pose themselves is intimately related to this one. How can the weaker tribe nonetheless dictate laws to the stronger, dispose of it, regulate its actions so far as they affect the weaker? One will think first of that mil uh, one will think first of that mildest kind of constraint, that constraint one, constraint one exercises when one has gained the affection of someone. someone. I feel like I'm in high school. Welcome back. <laughs> Welcome back to high school. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is thus also possible to exercise a constraint on the powers. Well, did I read that? Yeah, I did, but let, let me re redo that. One will think first of that mildest kind of constraint, that constraint one exercises when one has gained the affection of someone. It is thus also possible to exercise a constraint on the powers of nature through prayers and pleadings, through submission, through engaging regularly to give presents and offerings, through flattering glorifications, inasmuch as by doing so one obtains their affection. Love binds and is bound. He, you know, he's reflecting on these early tribes or even, you know, current tribes. Then one can conclude tre uh, treaties, uh, treaties under which both parties commit themselves to a certain course of conduct, pledge securities and exchange oaths. But much more important than this is a species of more violent constraint through magic and sorcery. Just as man is able to, uh, just as man is able with the aid of the sorcerer to harm an enemy stronger than himself, just as the sorcery of love can operate at a distance, so the weaker man believes he can influence the mightier spirits of nature too. Right, the weaker and the stronger. Uh, well, it kind of, uh, yeah, a little bit Christian. Well, this is a more fundamental way of thinking about it. The chief means the chief means employed uh, by all sorcery by all sorcery is that of getting into one's power something belonging to another. Hair, hair, nail, food from his table, even his picture or his name. Thus equipped uh, yeah. The, well, we still have people that believe stuff like this. 
uh, thus equipped, one can then practice sorcery. For the basic presupposition is that to everything spiritual, there pertains something corporal. <laughs> now, now I'm thinking of the uh, Descartes, the whole corporal thing. That to everything spiritual, there pertains something corporal. With its aid, one is able to bind, harm, destroy the spirit. The corporal provides the handle with which one can grasp the spiritual. Also earlier, you could think of Descartes when he criticized, you know, well, not criticized, but observed uh, during the Enlightenment, how they still upheld, you know, religion. Some of those scientists. With its aid, able to bind, harm, destroy the spirit. The corporal provides the handle with which one can grasp the spiritual. So that as man thus influences other men, so he also influences some spirit of nature. For the latter too has its corporal aspect by which it can be grasped. The tree and compare with it the seed from which it originated, originated uh, this enigmatic juxta juxtaposition seems to demonstrate that one and the same spirit has incorporated itself in both forms, one small, one big. A stone that suddenly rolls away is the body in which a spirit is active. If a rock lies on a lonely heath uh, and it seems impossible that human strength could ever have su sufficed to take it there, it must have moved there itself. That's the belief here. Um, all right. All right, yeah. Uh, see you later, uh, self-serving prick. <laughs> uh, you too. Have, have a great, great, great day. And uh, say hello to the friend. <laughs> and uh, yeah. See you, see you some other day. All right. Let me redo that a little bit. Uh, a stone that, so it's the whole, you know, basically voodoo stuff. Uh, you know, we, people still believe in a lot of this stuff. A stone that suddenly rolls away is the body in which a spirit is active. If a rock lies uh, on a lonely heat and it seems impossible that the human strength could ever have sufficed to take it there, it must have moved it there itself. Uh, that is to say, it must harbor a spirit. Because you can't really explain it, you know, no one put it there. Everything that has a body is accessible to sorcery. Thus, the spirits of nature are so too. If a god is actually tied to this image, then one can also exercise quite direct constraint upon him through denial of sacrificial food, scourging, flattering, and the like. To force, to force from their god the goodwill he is denying them, the common people in China... Uh, wind ropes around his image, pull it down and drag it along the streets through the mud and dung. You dog of a spirit, they say. We let you live in a splendid temple. We covered you with gold. We, f we fed you well. We sacrificed to you. And yet you're so ungrateful. <laughs> yeah, that's basically how they, yeah. Similar violent measures have been taken against images of saints and of the Virgin in the Catholic lands even in the present century, uh, when they have refused to do their duty in times of pestilence or drought, right? It's, it's basically, you see, he connects it with Christianity there, and he just means that it's still there, in that sense. Although it's more in a general sense, if you think about the whole, how the strong, how the weak can influence the strong, that's more in a, in a different sense, right? more of a relational thing. All these magical relationships with nature ca called countless cer ceremonies into existence. Called countless ceremonies into existence, yeah. And finally, when their confusion had grown too great, an effort was made to order and systematize them. Right. When, when their confusion had grown too great, well, that's his you know, reflection here, why it became like different here. An effort was made to, to order and systematize them so that not everything can be correct, you know. Uh, so that one came to believe that the favorable progress of the whole course of nature and especially of the great succession of the seasons of the year 
was guaranteed by a corresponding progress of a system of procedures. Like, uh, yeah, almost predictability or, you know, even more comfort. The meaning of the religious cult is to determine and constrain nature for the benefit of mankind. Yeah. That is to say, to impress upon it a regularity and rule of law, exactly predictability. Rule of law, which it does not at first possess, while in the present age, one seeks to understand the laws of nature so as to accommodate oneself to them. Right. Right. In even stories, it's like, be one with nature there. You know. Uh, uh, not one with nature, but uh, uh, be according to nature. In brief, the religious cult rests uh, on the ideas of sorcery as between man and man. And the sorcerer is older than the priest. But, but it likewise... Uh, and the sorcerer is older than the priest, right? Uh, right, like I said earlier, like the whole shaman thing. But it likewise rests on other and nobler ideas. So it's not just one thing. It presupposes relations of sympathy between man and man, the existence of goodwill, gratitude, the hearing of petitions, treaties between enemies, and bestowal of pledges, the claim of protection of property. Even at very low stages of culture, man does not stand towards nature as its impotent slave, right? Uh, he is not necessarily its willless servant. At the stage of religion attained by the Greeks, especially in relation to the gods of Olympus, it is even it is even as though uh, two castes. Uh, it's even it's even as though two castes lived side by side, a nobler and mightier one, uh, a nobler and mightier, and one less noble. But both somehow belong together in their origins and are of one species. They have no need to be ashamed of one another. That is the element of nobility in Greek religiosity. Right. Element of nobility there. I think he kind of wants to extract that. And, you know, maybe that's the revival uh, in us. You know, what we keep from that past. Um, let me see here. How long have I gone for? One hour, basically. I should probably continue a little bit. A little bit longer. Uh, almost 100 pages there. Well, yeah, 65 according to the book. Uh, 112. On viewing certain antique sacrificial implements, how many sensations have been lost us can be seen, for example, in the union of the farcical, even the obscene, with the religious feeling. Our sense of the possibility of this combination dwindles. We comprehend that it existed only historically in the festivals of Demeter and Dionysus, in the Christian Easter and mystery plays. But we, we too still know the sublime in concert with the burlesque and the like, the moving blended with the ludicrous, which a later age will turn perhaps no longer, in turn perhaps no longer comprehend, right? It is no, uh, what are your, what are your overall thoughts so far about all of this? Uh, or, hello, uh, not good at games. Uh, <laughs> Um, do you mean uh, what I've read so far here? Or I mean, yeah, it's a very, very interesting way of looking at it. And I don't think it's that wrong, actually. Um, the way he reflects on, on, uh, on early religious cults and also where it comes from. Um, a lot of these things. Yeah, I don't know. I, I suppose I've only been listening to around 10 minutes. So the last 10 minutes of reading. <laughs> All right. I don't know how much that was, but 
Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, there is a lot of truth in this. Although there are, you know, there are things you could add, of course. Um, and, uh, but it depends on also a little bit on, you know, he generalizes here. It depends a little bit on which, you know, uh, in modern day um, hunter-gatherer tribes. It depends on how you look at these things. Now, obviously, he's looking at religion here. Uh, but if we look at, uh, uh, but if we look at um, life in general and stuff like that, uh, then the whole individuality and, and the, the tribe thing, they still respect the individual in a lot of ways, uh, you know. But, yeah. But in terms, ter you know, he's not talking about that, so... So yeah, I don't know. May I ask a few questions? Sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I think I think this part here was kind of, I don't know. It, it's not that. I don't know what's what's so you know. I don't think it's weird at all. I mean, for. Uh, First, may the ends justify the means. Uh, in terms, of, like, what are we talking about here? What are, What do you mean here? That's a very general statement, in my opinion. You gotta give me a, a an example. In any case, no. But you can't generalize that much. Uh, no. That doesn't make sense to me. May the ends ever justify the means? Well, probably. Um, well, you know, it depends on what we're talking about. You know. Maybe it is. Maybe it does sometimes. <laughs> okay. Uh, you think of an example and... Uh, I don't know. We can discuss that. Hey, what's up, buddy? What's up, little T? Maybe it does in some cases. Depends also on which mor moral system also you're thinking out of. Uh, but anyway, I think most people, is it the greater priority to be good or not or no truth? I mean, what does good mean here? You know, that's the thing. Like, what is good and evil? Because it's not exactly the same in all moral systems. I really like your accent. Can you Venmo me one, please? Uh, I've heard of Venmo, but uh, I'm not sure. I'm not 100% sure what Venmo is. Wait, let me just check. All oh, right, digital wallet. Right, right, right. We don't use that here. Cash at me, yeah, exactly. Cash at me, bad boys. Um, yeah. But yeah, like, uh, you know, uh, knowing the truth, like, to make that easier, would you prefer someone behave according to, let's say, your perception of what is good or new, or n know what you consider to be true? I don't really see how it's connected even with, like, Would you prefer someone behave according as in you? 
Well, that does make it, would you prefer someone behave according to, let's say, your perception of what is good? Uh, or know what you consider to be true? Well, maybe it's the same thing, right? Like maybe, maybe ultimate goodness is actually ultimate truthness. <laughs> and you will believe that depending on what you believe in, right? I apologize, apparently I'm doing a terrible job of conveying my questions. Uh, I, I do understand your question, I think, but um, the thing is, there is a problem there. And uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, uh, you know, uh, g give an exact example and uh, you'll see what can come out of that. And also, I'm not sure you'll like my morality, but <laughs> we'll see. Look, here's the thing. My... <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> like, like an, uh, give an exact example. Uh -huh. You do the thinking a little bit. <laughs> You're the one that tries to make a uh, thought experiment here. And also, sometimes, you know, these thought experiments doesn't really adhere to reality. So, but for the sake of our thought experiment, I ask that good is a known thing and so is truth. But then, you know, objectively, what and then ask which of the two is more important for someone to possess. But that's the thing, they can be connected. Like, there is no more here. Uh, if you possess truth, then you possess goodness. You know? What if that's the case? You know? <laughs> what if they're deeply tied like that? And what kind of truth then? Like, right? So you're thinking at separate things. Like, it's not a, it's not the same thing for you. Well, you would know the truth of how to behave towards someone. If you have, let's say, absolute truth, let's say, you would know the goodness and the badness totally in all the ways. But now we're talking like all-knowing thing or something. But that's not the case in reality. So that's not realistic. If you know the truth, you can know how to be good and then play Raid Shadow Legends all night, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's the best answer, I, I think. <laughs> uh, a real, like, Fortnite battle royale. <laughs> right, that's the truth. I think you're thinking of it but uh, a little T actually made a good point there in the beginning of the sentence. You know, if you know the truth, you can know how to be good. All right. If you know the truth, you know how to be good. Person, person one knows many things of the natural world and many facts, etc., but decides to torture babies for no other reason than his pleasure. Person two does not know many things about the world, but has behaved at least in a way that is not absurdly immoral, all right? But, uh, you know, someone that understands the world and all the facts, or many facts, uh, I would think uh, someone like that wouldn't torture babies for no good reason, because then you're not using your reason, you're using your whatever, you know, desire or something. So anyway, anyway, I'm going to read a little bit here. So, so it's not that easy just, you know, this is, <laughs> that's the thing. 112 here. On viewing certain antique sacrificial implement, is there a distinction between knowledge and wisdom? Yes. 
Well, uh, yeah, there is, but there is not a huge distinction. <clears throat> Well, there is in terms of if you're talking about understanding, but I think this guy's saying we've all chosen to be good cause because some people believe in God and that the people who choose no might not be on earth anymore. Um, <laughs> might be on a pla Fortnite planet, <sighs> right? So one can be knowledgeable, but not wise. Uh, no, uh, one can know many one can know much information but not be wise yes wisdom is the utilization of wisdom of knowledge but actually just just having a bunch of inf information in you is actually not knowledge knowledge because knowledge also implies that you're filtering through things here like this is correct information this is not correct information wise and real. Huh? On viewing certain antique sacrificial implements. But that's the thing. Someone with a deep knowledge of things, like if you have deep knowledge of things, then you are wise, you know? Just in regular terms here. Because you can see all the perspectives, let's say. But someone who just tortures for the sake of it doesn't see all the right? Because you would see the perspective of the baby, the pain, the suffering from their family and whatever, you know. So you wouldn't, you know, you would understand this. That's why that person wouldn't be that. So yeah. <laughs> all right, 112. On viewing certain antique sacrificial implements, how many sensational, no, how many sensations have been lost us? Maybe I should stop around here actually. Maybe we'll continue next time. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, all right, I'm, I'm gonna read a. At least this one, 112. On viewing certain antique sacrificial implements, how many sensations have been lost, uh, has been lost us can be seen, for example, in the union of the farcical, even the obscene, with the religious feeling, our sense of the possibility of this combination dwindles. We comprehend that it existed. Oh, I already read this. <laughs> we comprehend that it existed only in only historically in the festivals of Demeter and Dionysius, right? Union of the farcical, even the obscene, with the religious feeling. Yeah. Uh, the Christian Easter and the mystery plays. Uh, but we, we too still know the sublime in concert with the burlesque and the like, and the moving blended with the ludicrous, which a later age will in turn perhaps no longer comprehend, right? It will be beyond, you know, probably, maybe. And uh, uh, let me see here. 130. Christianity and antiquity. I'll, I'll get back to this a little bit here. And just, I think I want to, I want to do this last one. Christianity and antiquity. When on a Sunday morning we hear the bells ringing, well, maybe I should. There's a lot of Christianity stuff now. No, I, I'll, I'll end it here. The next time we'll go into Christianity a little bit more. I think that's a okay ending there. Uh, what motivates you or I to be good? Or I to be good is not necessarily the same motivation that leads others to be good, right? I mean, uh, first off, you know, um, the whole good thing depends on which culture we're talking from which morality system, you know, not all people, uh, some people might find it good that, like, let's take example, uh, for example, um, the Inca Indians, right? They sacrificed babies, 
and that was a good thing because you sacrifice them to the gods and the gods will give us you know better harvest and blah 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 right so uh, it's survival that that motivates you it's always survival that motivates you but it depends on the rules in which you live in all right so and we we live in these kind of rules here in our society here and not even here it's exactly the same uh, in all of them i understand that an objective good exists and the only way we way to come close to it is through reason well uh, i'm not sure there is an objective good actually except you know uh, what is the objective good here wouldn't we, we be able to do that by now being able to perceive something as good doesn't mean it faces the test of objective reason what is objective reason i mean reason is not objective uh, reason is a tool like reason i mean to me reason is just reflection it's the same thing basically we made up this whole reason thing but if you mean uh, like reality reality that's a different thing objective reality well how cosmos behaves but that's a there is no morality there so that doesn't make sense to scrutinize without emotion yeah but uh, when we talk when we talk about morality that's basically impossible you're tied to existence so how are you going to do that without emotion <laughs> you know you value your existence anyway uh yeah i don't know i think that's it i think that's it otherwise is it possible through higher thought what is higher higher thought there is no higher thought to remove oneself more and more from simple human existence uh, Yeah, but we're not there yet you know uh maybe in the future humans can do well they're not going to be human really they're going to be something else higher thought is that which is other than the simple thoughts that come on all animals like so you mean abstract thought like a uh, layer thinking uh thinking in abstractions but abstractions is really just comparison between subconscious images and language and all that stuff so it's not really have you read beyond good and evil yes i've read beyond good and evil uh but it's been a while since i've read beyond good and evil but uh yeah well no I, I i check it every every so often although mostly thus books out of fiction uh namely that thought or hunt to eat we produce whatever humans are unique in higher thought that is the distinction factor between men and other animals uh, but it's not higher thought like it's just a it's it's a more complex version yeah of uh, animals yes there is something there that we do that is different but it's not just thought it's actually also making technology but that's of course it is connected but I highly recommend Ethics by Spinoza, pretty original stuff, yes, yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah. 
yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm ending this now. Um, so yeah, you can vote for which book I should read next. It's in the info panel. You can, you can, you know, you can subscribe to the YouTube if you want to. Um, I upload videos there. And uh, yeah, um, that's that. So yeah, I don't know what else to add here. Um, so yeah, I, I'm done with the reading. So um, so yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, what I do here, I read books, and that's that's it. <laughs> I read philosophy books, and uh, so yeah, you you can of course go back and listen to the parts. I read the whole Meditations by, by Descartes. Uh, I didn't read the whole Untimely Meditations, but maybe I will one day. But yeah, so, so yeah, that's it. That's it. Uh, thank God for YouTube. I wake up too late. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. All right, guys. Uh, I will see you next time. And uh, have a great evening or day or whatever it is there. And uh, I will see you soon. Goodbye.